Welcome to the September 26, 2023 City Council work session. I'd now like to turn it over to City Manager Benda to walk us through the agenda overview. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor, members of City Council. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, today, during our work session, uh, we have a couple items uh, that many of you have posed questions about, one of which has to do with the regulation of taxi cabs. Kent White, Assistant City Manager, will kind of give you a background. It's, it's a topic that's come up with some frequency, and, and he'll again do a, a very good job. And then I think later this evening, under public comment, one of the um, people who actually operate a taxi cab company will appear before you to give public comment then. Uh, flooding event. So uh, one of the things that I found in, in arriving here in Central Virginia, that despite its topography and its hilliness and um, maybe less close to water, albeit there's a large body of wa uh, water just adjacent to us, the James River, <clears throat> we still contend with flooding. So in July, we had a very substantive event that um, Tim and I were out together in the wee hours standing on what was formerly College Lake Bridge, concerned that maybe the earth and berm could give way. And so I thought, if anything, to, uh, to kind of give you a, a kind of a level set understanding of what these events, because they're happening with more frequency and what it means to overall city operations, who responds, what kind of um, elements or aspects, characteristics of those events that we contend with well after the event, right? Uh, one of which, and you'll see here, there's the 12th Street Stabilization options and I know Mr. Taylor and Dr. Wilder we've spoken about 12th Street and its access into downtown we've kept it closed because the the earth there during this event fell onto the roadway we were able to clean it up but we've kept it as it is because um, there are options we're going to give you at least three today they have different prices to them and we're going to engage you on uh, your level of um, interest in each and also a path forward because it's going to require that we come back and uh, move some money around because it's not inexpensive I know that the vice mayor and I had talked recently about, well, why does it cost so much? And I, uh, today, I believe between Tim and Gaynell, they'll kind of explain the expenses associated with that repair. Uh, then we move into business item briefings, which um, if you remember, these are those uh, elements or aspects of your normal docket process that will come back to you and require a vote. So what we do is we ensure that you are briefed on them. We uh, you know, hear your questions and if there's uh, direction by you and your peers, Mayor, to kind of engage with staff, we do, or with um, whomever it is that's bringing it forward, and if you've got questions. You then have roll call and then closed session. And before I turn it back to you, Madam Mayor, if it's okay, I thought I'd highlight uh, another new member to Team Lynchburg. Now, what's interesting about this newest member, um, this member has been with us. Um, he has uh, held many different hats over the years, not, not simply just when I have been here, um, but I, I really think, uh, when, no further ado, Kent White has been uh, chosen as Assistant City Manager. Very excited about his... Um, he has a storied career, 20 plus years in our community development department. And um, when I first arrived just over two years ago, he really helped um, just kind of step up and step in. And I think at total, um, with, with uh, extending him the offer, he, I think he was wearing as many as three hats because you were acting Rex Parks, you were acting community development, and then you were also assistant city manager. So I think he's happy to just wear the one and, uh, and I'm happy that he's, he's decided to take the position. So thank you for that, Mayor, and turn it back to you. And congratulations, Kent White. We appreciate you. Your one hat looks great. <laughs> okay, moving on to business item briefings. Appeal of the Historic Preservation Commission decision to deny a certificate of appropriateness, COA, at... No, the first uh, work session item. Oh, I'm sorry. I got so excited about your hat. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. That I just skipped over everything. Where did Okay, thank you, Councilman Hungus. I appreciate that. Okay. Back at, we'll back it up. Work session agenda items. City regulation of taxi cabs. Mr. White. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, and members of City Council. Uh, the goal is to just give you the briefest of overviews about taxi cab regulation, uh, including your most recent actions or Council's most recent actions with regards to rates. Uh, this was brought forward by Councilmember Mischens and Councilmember Helgeson um, for the overview. At, at this point, there's no action that's imminent on this until you kind of direct us beyond. We just kind of wanted to give the updates and then um, kind of set up your discussion from there. Uh, so with that, um, so regulations of taxi cabs have been in place since 1931 in the city. Um, the requirements are really structured around three components, public safety, general operations, and then the rates themselves. 
So when we talk about public safety, what we're really talking about is um, registration by the owners and operators of taxi companies um, in terms of their fleet and um, what considerations they use with their drivers. So the police department, you may know, does background checks on drivers. And this is really about um, creating public confidence for the riders and also kind of our visitors who come to the city. You can imagine a lot of visitors come, who come in, they're pulling uh, they're hopping into cabs and going into an unfamiliar place, and we want that experience to be really welcoming for them. Uh, in terms of operations, it ranges from everything from uh, requirements for a business license to uh, things like uh, a, a, the, uh, a, the requirements for a manifest, for drivers to maintain their manifest or their log of where they travel, um, their fares, and that sort of thing. And lastly, it includes that appeals process. If there's something awry with the registration process, it sets out a formal process where, where we can have the appropriate hearings around that. And then the rates, as you can imagine, are really um, based on two things, distance of travel and wait times. Um, that's not to say there, that's, all, that's all that's set out in council, but those are the main two things. And then there are some ancillary uh, pieces to that that are defined specifically in code. So city council last reviewed rates in February of 2022. Um, as uh, city manager Benda said, this has been an item that has been before you on several occasions, but the last time the rates themselves were amended were in 2008. Uh, at the time that council reviewed this, one of the things that they did was go back through the regulations, talk specifically about and get input from public safety about whether their processes were valuable. Uh, the Lynchburg Police Department did affirm at that time that they felt the um, the registration process and the background checks were a beneficial component that worked cooperatively with the owners and operators. Um, also, the taxi cab owners themselves um, submitted a petition where they supported council setting the rates and regulations. Um, they specifically um, spoke about uh, two things. One, certainty for passengers um, to know the fares. Um, different, say, from like a ride share system where your rate is based on peak demand having a fixed rate was something that they repeatedly heard from their customers, so uh, that they liked that, that certainty. And then some means, um, what they stated was uh, to avoid kind of price wars back and forth between the, uh, the different uh, taxi cab companies. Um, I do want to point out that over the last decade, council has um, taken actions to provide some flexibility within those ordinances. In 2016, uh, they removed a requirement for a certificate of operation. This was something that the owners had to file uh, annually that gave them the right to operate. Um, we took more, uh, council at that point took more of a free market approach to um, if you're meeting the requirements, then you can have uh, the then you can have uh, then you can set up the formal regulation here, and you didn't have to have that that ongoing certificate, another maintenance item associated with it. And then in 2021, or excuse me, in 2019, council um, took a really different tact. Um, outside of what, if you when you've ridden in a taxi cab, you're, you're familiar with the fixed taxi meter, you know that uh, that displays your fare. Um, there was a option provided within code that allowed uh, drivers to use an electronic means. And this was really to kind of set the tone for the future of how uh, operators could continue to adjust. Um, they still had to match the rates that were in city code, but they could use a different means to track that. Um, with that, I'll say that council historically is not required to um, have a taxi cab ordinance. They are not required to hold a public hearing, but historically uh, council has, especially due to the longevity of it, and especially in terms of when they're looking at rates. Um, they, they like to, or in the past, there's been a setup where they've notified the public and allowed given time to speak. Um, and outside of that, as Mr. Benda said, um, we have uh, heard from at least some taxi cab owners and operators, and I believe one of them has signed up for public comment uh, this evening to give you a chance to kind of hear some of, some of what their observations are about this. 
Um, outside of that, that's the, the briefest of summaries for uh, the tax cab ordinance. My colleague, uh, Mr. Friedman and I, he was here with us at 2022 when we uh, went through these. So we're happy to answer what questions we have, uh, which questions you have, or bring back any information. So. Uh, yes, so this first came up in 2008, and I see the minutes, and that's why it's kind of good to have good minutes so we can read. Some of it kind of didn't really say anything, but um, later on uh, in these minutes, as I'm reading, brought up the fact that why are we actually setting rates as a, you know, as a government? And Kim Payne, as city manager at the time, said, I have no idea. And first time we've ever done it you know, in a long time because, uh, and just saw it, and several people at that time said, you know, and I think it's fairly clear here, it says that you know, in the fall we should talk about if we want to just get out of this setting of the rates. We don't set rates for hamburgers, of drive through or hair treatments, or hair jellies, or whatever. And it, it seems odd that we set the, the taxi cab rates, and keep in mind how slow government sometimes works. As we read the minutes, 2008 was first brought up about talking about repealing it. And I think hopefully now we can repeal this and let the actual free market work. I know sometimes people think, oh, there'll be price wars. Well, who benefits from price wars? Customer. Who also benefits from price wars and com competition is the cab companies themselves. I mean, they could decide to say, we want to be more expensive and we want to have luxury. We want to have leather seats and air conditioning and, and invest back in, in the businesses or back in their, their cabs and whatnot, um, as opposed to coming to council anytime there's gasoline increases and they come to us and say we have to add a dollar fuel charge and whatnot. So hopefully this council is of the opinion, once we kind of talk about it, is to say let's just get out of the setting of the rates of the taxi cab business. I think last year there was a vote. Um, two of us voted against you know, those rates. Uh, at first, like I said, it's been happening a long time and it's been slow. So hopefully we can get, I'm inclined for us to, and hopefully the rest of us will agree that it's time to get out of setting taxi cab rates for private businesses. And I think we need to repeal this ordinance, let them, the free market, decide on how much they want to charge. You have now Uber, you have Lyft, you have all these other things we don't set the rates for. And, and it helps our consumers and it helps the citizens of Lynchburg who need to get to where work, school, or play. So I, I hope we can repeal it. Um, sounds like we don't have to have a public hearing. Um, to repeal, I'm fine with having a public hearing or not having a public hearing with repealing it, but I hope we can uh, vote to repeal rather than setting rates. Dr. Wilder? Yes, if I remember correctly, when we discussed it last year um, and the, the, the city team got with the taxi cab drivers, they requested that we set the rate. So it was a decision from the taxi cab owners that met and agreed upon and wanted us to set the rate. So that's why I, I, I'm trying to, trying to understand, is there, has there been a change in their direction from, from the taxi cab companies? Have they voiced concerns about that rate? Are they voiced concerns about the regulation of it? Because from, from last time, they were all kind of in agreement to, for the city to continue to set the rate. Even though we know there's Uber, there's left there's really other options, but they themselves want us to continue to set that particular rate. Have you heard anything else from the c cab owners? Yes, sir. A, a couple, we and the ones we've been able to contact so far have indicated that they are still interested in um, uh, the city setting the rate oh. for the regions that they said before. I, I don't, I want to be careful about talking about what anyone else said. And again, we'll hear from one owner um, this evening. Yeah, I, I think it'd be helpful to hear, before we change the policy, I think it'd be helpful to us to have a discussion with the cab owners, just to kind of see what all of them are saying to see has something changed within the past year. Thank, thank you. Of missions. <clears throat> so, um, you know, when I when I look at this and and I, and I see that we're setting rates for a private industry for a private business, um, kind of uneasy with that. So, if if the realtors in the city get together and they decide they're going to raise the percentage of commission on listings and sales, that's an antitrust violation. Right? It's against the law. So here we are, as a government, sitting down with the taxicab companies and setting 
the rate. I, I kind of just don't see that as an ethical way to, to do it. Um, and we need to be out of the business of regulating the prices of the, of the taxi cabs. It's just, uh, it's the, the biggest thing that it does is it prevents other people, aspiring entrepreneurs potentially, from getting into the taxi cab business. And the government actually has their thumb on this and is controlling the rates. So I would be completely inclined to repealing this. Um, I think it's an easy thing to do. Uh, and I definitely, um, you know, if, if, if uh, businesses are in cahoots with the government to prevent competition from entering, we need to eliminate that. If I may, I will say that yeah. state code is, is the one that, that sets and enables uh, this piece. And to your point, it is a little different in that the state code specifically almost encourages local regulation. Now, again, yeah. to the extent is, is completely up to the governing body, but yeah. rates are including, included in that. Because so I, I think of, like, when you mentioned the certificate, that, that, that brings me to mind, yeah. like, the medallion, right? That's, yeah. that's what that was, right? Yes, sir. Back in the day, it was yeah. the medallion, and, and you know, yeah. being from the Northeast and understanding how all those yeah. things worked, you know, and some of those cities are essentially run by organized crime, mm -hmm. right? Well, we don't need to have that here. And uh, I think that we can get out of the business of setting the rates for private businesses that actually prevents aspiring entrepreneurs from trying to come in and compete at a lower rate. Because that's really, it's not necessarily whether or not one cab company can undercut the other and start the price war, right? But how do you get into business? You provide value, right? So what you do is you provide something that people want at a better price than somebody else, right? Right now, we don't have the ability for somebody young to, to be an aspiring entrepreneur and come in and offer a better cab experience at a better price because we set the rates. Uh, Vice Mayor Farley. Oh, sorry. Uh, I want to thank uh, my colleagues for bringing this forward. I, I certainly uh, maintain my position from two years ago that um, if, if uh, this industry needs the flexibility to increase prices, especially associated with inflation, then they need the flexibility to be able to do that. And um, ultimately, I, I, I do submit that the companies should be the ones to figure out what would be best rates to charge on their own um, to meet their needs uh, for their employees, but also for their riders. Um, in the end, I, I would submit that we would have a h higher quality taxi system in the city. Um, simply put, it creates a bit of a competition um, between the various organizations in the city that would um, be f trying to find the way of who is most desired to be utilized. And so I, I would agree that um, we... Um, as a local body should should not be in the business of setting rates for one industry over another um, so I, I'll, I'll be consistent in my um, advocacy and in, in saying we should not be um, in the business of setting rates um, I don't think we ever should have not 20 years ago and, and not now Councilman Taylor no what you done please? No. okay <laughs> Councilman Dolan no Thank you. Uh, yeah, I supported this the last go around because the uh, drivers were taxi cab drivers and owners were overwhelmingly uh, asking us to support it, and I was really more interested in having some more conversation about it so we could make some uh, decision based on our own. I think Vice Mayor, uh, his uh, flexibility argument is certainly, uh, uh, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. So I probably would support. All right. Well, thank you very much. So, oh, so with that, Council I guess Thompson. we should give direction. I, 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 if you want a motion, but I'll, I'll move that we direct the city to uh, begin the process of repealing the taxi cab ordinance. Um, if council wants to have a public hearing on it, perfectly fine. Um, but at least the direction so they can begin what needs to be done. What's, what's the thoughts of a public hearing? I, 
if I may, um, to your point, uh, I think at Ford's, uh, this, this afternoon or evening, you're gonna have um, one of the cab owners um, himself here. I think by having a public hearing, it might afford and give time to other potential operators for them to come out and kind of voice their opinions to you. So I think uh, if you're amenable to it, I would recommend a public hearing so as to ensure that you hear the, the voices. So, so, so my motion would be then to, to have a public hearing on repealing the tax cab board. Uh, Councilman Dole, hold on one second. No. Okay. I just seconded a motion. I have the floor, Madam Mayor. Councilman Jones? No comment. Councilman Dolan. I thought you wanted to say something. Well, oh, I was, Dr. Wilder. Well, no, I, was just, I was just trying to, I want to interrupt while uh, the council member was speaking. I was just saying, as long as we, um, I think the last time the city staff got with the cab owners and just to see what their concerns were and their thoughts were, and then they had brought it back to us. I just thought that was very helpful to hear what the cab owners had to say. I just thought it was really helpful the last time. That's why it, it changed my thoughts when I heard what the cab owners wanted. Mm -hmm. That's why, um, I like to kind of hear that again to see if something has changed and what direction the cap owners were saying. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor? Uh, yes, <clears throat> please. Um, what we could do, if it's amenable um, to, to the body, we could, uh, during the work session, ahead of your, whether it's a public hearing, if you decide for it, um, that, uh, that afternoon, we can brief it again, tell you what we found out, all the, the, you know, give you that feedback, Dr. Wilder. And then based on that, then we, you'll have a public hearing that you'll hear sensibly from the owners themselves as well. So I think if that's amenable as far as making sure that you get that input ahead of, ahead of the public hearing, we could do that during a work session. I, I like that idea. Um, and also, I, uh, quick question for our parliamentarian. Are, we're not supposed to be making motions or voting during work session right now, are we? That's correct. Unless there's a, an exception to where two thirds agree to adopt the motion. I, I do have one question that uh, it's probably just a point of clarification on the motion that was made is the the discussion was surrounding the rates and the charges is the motion to repeal the entirety of the taxi cab ordinance in its full entirety or just the portions that refer to the rates the ordinance in its entirety because I think the entirety of the ordinance is revolving around the rates um, obviously, they're, they're, you know, when we get into other things, I think the word that really comes to mind is collusion. And I don't like to see that. Just let them set their rates, and I'm sure they can set their individual companies, can set their individual rates. We don't require McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, and Sonic to have the same prices for hamburgers um, because it would not allow other competition, or there may be. We don't allow that for prices of gasoline, you know, gallons of gas. So I like, unless there are specific things that need to be in here, um, but the, the instruction is to direct staff to come back with how we can repeal. Hopefully it's the whole ordinance. If not the whole ordinance, at least the rates or whatever has to be or can be removed. I think you said the state uh, likes to you know, say, hey, here you can do it if you want. There's enabling legislation because we're a Dillon rule state. We can't do anything unless we're expressly authorized by the state. So the state says you can do it if you want. We're now saying, hopefully, we don't want to be doing this anymore. We want the private uh, sectors to decide on what they're going to charge and repeal as much of it as we can. If we do have that public hearing, everybody's allowed at that public hearing, right? Both the cab owners the competitive cab owners, the people that would love, the, the riders that want to come out and say, you know, I'd really like a cleaner cab. I'd pay more. Or I'd like a little less expensive cab. I don't like collusion. I like competition. I think that would be the whole inference of the, the Anybody public Anybody and care. everybody. That would be it, Madam Mayor, I would just add one comment to it. Um, there is, and I do know that in the past, the regulation of the taxi cab in industry has also revolved around public safety. The idea that the city and the police department specifically are knowing who are operating taxi cabs, ensuring that they aren't criminals, ensuring that uh, they're going through the proper vetting process, permits being issued. Certainly, council has the ability to repeal all of it, but I, I would suggest it may be that staff also, as part of this, 
discussion brief city council on the safety component before considering that so can we without a vote then just ask uh, you to come back at another work session and present as a bib and have um, whoever are present to answer those questions first before we go to the next step without a vote I mean, I could whatever your pleasure I mean direction certainly. to bring it back with more questions answered that way okay I think well, I for all. No, the only thing I want to offer was I'm, I'm inclined to what Councilman Hegelson is saying. At the same token, if there are certain things that we should have in city code, I think we should have that full, full breadth of the discussion. I am inclined to go that direction, but we should have it for the full discussion. And, and we could have that Council full discussion on the uh, actual scheduling of the public hearing, right? If we yeah, schedule I, the public hearing because it's not going to happen tomorrow. I mean, it's going to take a while to schedule got to advertise and at the same time you're advertising you can be discovering what can be done what can't be removed what's wise to be kept in and we can, we can kind of walk and chew gum I don't think we need to have another uh, business item briefing on on something like this I could have um, Mr. Benda the, uh, I you didn't get oh okay right. Madam Mayor Councilman um, I go back to uh, kind of the budget process, you know, that we use the public hearing to hear from department heads, which I thought was kind of interesting. So if, you know, people have stuff to present to us from staff, they could present it in the public hearing as well, just like the department heads and even elected officials like the Commonwealth's attorney and sheriff were forced to come in here and deliver their presentation to us via public hearing. You know, we could, we could do it that way as well. Uh, Mr. Bender, you were going to speak um, earlier. What was your thought? Uh, Timing-wise, to Councilman Hagelson's point, um, so you know that we follow up uh, a week from today with uh, questions and or answers. We'll probably have something in your memo as of next Tuesday to give you some background on the ordinance. Um, the 10th, as early as the 10th of October, depending on to your scheduling point as a public hearing, I suspect would be the 26th of October. Um, and we could use the 10th or portion of the work session there to kind of give you feedback of what we found. So that's just a timeline of you're going to get information by next Tuesday on what we've learned, maybe some direction. The 10th, probably a follow-up briefing very quickly and then position depending on what the body have uh, prepared for the 26th of October. If I've got all those dates, I've got the dates right. So it's 10th, what is it? 10th of 24th. 10th and 24th, I missed the 24th. So uh, you'd come back with a presentation on the 10th and then plan on a public hearing on the 24th? Correct. Okay, yep. sounds good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we, 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 there's a motion a, uh, and a second on the floor. And so are we all in agreement? Well, that was the question was, it wasn't, yeah, so I'd ask the parliamentarian if we needed to make, if we could vote and. I think you could if, if they if agree, five members agrees. agree that it's, it's uh, appropriate to pass the motion and I understand the motion, at least for the what will come back after this, it'll be a repeal ordinance of the entire ordinance. P provided there's things that need to stay. You know, there's lots of flexibility there. So, Dr. Wilder. Uh, do we need a motion? Is that just a consensus of what they're bringing back for a business briefing and an agenda item? Does that need a motion for that? Uh, that? That wasn't a business item briefing. It was on the work session agenda. And so... So the question, the real question is, do we want to allow for a vote? Is everybody says yes, or we want to say yes, that's, because there is a motion and a second on the floor. Vice Mayor Foley. I think uh, what the council's gripping with here is just, this is the first time we're at a work session under this new procedure, and, and what precedent do we want to set? I would humbly submit that it should be the operation of the council that um, if there's a desire to debate something and move forward with it, and there's obvious consensus that we should move forward with it and then take up the merits of it at that time mm -hmm. rather than just do we believe, uh, should we paint the streets pink or should we not? Uh, if there's consensus that that should be at least debated, we should afford the respect of that, of that desire should we make the streets pink as an example. So uh, I would submit again that we should vote and that if there's a desire for it to move forward that, that we give it a thumbs up to continue down the process. That would, that would be my recommendation. So the motion on the floor is to repeal the ordinance, not to, to, to move to, forward with these presentations well, and well, the hearing. There, there, that's the schedule that, that I think was outlined, but that's what we're, ske we're scheduling the public. We're, we're asking the staff to, to move forward with repealing, however it can be repealed. With that, there's a two-step process. First step would be kind of giving us a little stuff on the 10th if possible but the real issue is scheduling it for the 24th I believe of October so we can have a public hearing be fully transparent and hear from citizens 
Well, I'm not comfortable with the with how the motion is then, because the motion makes it sound like we are going forward with, with the repealing process without having the full discussions first. I think that the motion should be that we are going to move forward with having the presentations and the public hearing, and at that time we discuss and vote to repeal the ordinance. Because right now, the way it sounds to me that we're, if we vote right now, we're agreeing that we're going to repeal the ordinance. Isn't no, that how it comes across? It, it, if, if I could. Councilman um, If I may, as, as I seconded the motion, the way that I understood the motion was that we are going to begin the process, right? It's kind of interesting because we're sitting here talking about regulating taxi companies, and here we are struggling with the uh, regulation we put on ourselves through the rules of procedure that are overarching right now. Um, and uh, it's uh, the, the motion was to start the process, right, which was also mentioned having a public hearing to move towards repealing it. Nobody said we're repealing it. It's a motion to start the process to repeal it, right? And that was to include a public hearing if we needed to, presentations from staff if we needed to. There was a lot of flexibility in the motion. That's the motion that I seconded in the way that I understand it. If we were to adopt or pass this motion, what's going to occur is they're going to be given direction by a majority, either to move forward or to not, to schedule the business item briefing, to schedule the public hearing, to prepare the ordinance from our city attorney or the repeal of the ordinance, the documents to do that. That is what is being done. That is the motion that I seconded. That's the way that I understand it. Um, so I, I think that uh, it's the right way to go because we should not be in the business of regulating private sector industries from this day. And it still requires Vice Mayor Feroldi. And, and, and I do, this is a standard practice of legislative bodies on multiple, multiple levels is, you know, we're not, I'm casting a yes vote not in consideration of the policy, yes or no, but slating it for a full-fledged yeah. debate. And, and that's, that's what I'm voting for is to, to take it to the next step. Okay. So. And that's fine. I just want to make sure that everything was clear for, mm -hmm. for transparency and everybody that's listening and watching, they understand what's happening. And because when you say repeal the process or repeal the ordinance, that's how people will receive it. I want to make sure that they understand. But thank you for your thorough explanation, Council Missions, because I wouldn't have understood that without that. So um, if we want to go ahead and vote, let's vote on the motion on the floor, please. The motion passes 6-1. Okay, moving on to flooding event after action review, Ms. Gay Nelhart. I'm going to open it up and do a Oh, you're not Gay Nelhart. Uh, <laughs> I'm Mr. Mitchell. How are you? you? The better one will follow me. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you an overview of what happened from a water resources perspective for the flood events. And just uh, to recap, the storm began Thursday afternoon and continued into the next morning. Uh, July 13th and 14th, and actually there was another storm that hit the, sat the, ne the Saturday after that, the 15th, and going into Sunday morning, the 16th, that had a, even a bigger s impact on water resources. Uh, so the storm itself was seven to seven and a half inches of rain over a six hour period that was estimated to be um, about a 500 to 1,000 year storm event from VDM. Um, Public Works responded, uh, barricading flooded roads and removing down trees, and then Water Resources also responded. So the most significant thing that we were dealing with was College Lake. Um, and ironically, the storm event that occurred on Saturday had a bigger, much bigger impact on the lake than the storm that happened on Thursday. And that's, there are a number of reasons for that. One, the uh, ground was already saturated from the storm that happened on Thursday. But also, um, the storm that hit Saturday night just kind of sat over the College Lake watershed and just kept feeding water into the, into the watershed. So we activated the emergency action plan for both events, uh, the 713 and 715 storm event. The 13th reached a stage two level. And so we have three different stages when we're looking at the, the dam. Uh, Kind of stage one is just kind of putting on every, everybody on alert that there's something going on with the dam. Stage two is getting more serious, and then stage three we have to start evacuations. 
The 715 storm event actually exceeded stage three as far as the level goes. And there's a number of factors that go into determining what stage we're at. A level is one factor. The intensity of rainfall is another factor. And then conditions on the ground is, is the third factor. Uh, we didn't officially declare stage three on the 15th um, because that triggers another cascading uh, a cascade of events. One, the National Weather Service issues a, a toned alert to all cell phones in the area. This would have been about 2 o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning, uh, saying that the dam is imminently going to fail and you need to evacuate now. We would also have had to have started evacuations if it declared to stage 3. So even though the level was at stage 3 and above, we held off on declaring a stage 3 because the, the rain had stopped about midnight and we, during the subsequent time after that, when the, we reached stage three, we were calculating what the crest was going to be and when the, the crest was going to occur um, based upon the time of concentration of the water in the watershed, getting to the lake. And we didn't think it was going to overtop, but we're monitoring it very closely. Um, so it got to within six inches of us declaring a stage three and evacuating and it got to within a foot and a half of actually overtopping the roadway. And with an earthen dam like this is, if it overtops, it could fail at any moment. So it was a very serious event. Um, another thing that complicated the matter was, and I think uh, City Manager Benda was out on the dam when this was found, a major seep, which is a leak, water leaking through the face of the dam was found and we were considering evacuating because of that seep. Um, but in the whole duration of that event, we were in communication with VDEM, National Weather Service, uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation's Dam Safety Division, so they, everybody knew what was going on and the decisions we were making. And the good news is we have put the project for College Lake Dam removal out to bid. Bids are due October 11th, so we're anxiously awaiting to see what those bids are going to be. Some other impacts that we had, um, and we're still in the process of, of identifying impacts because with, the, with where our infrastructure is along streams and creeks, um, with the vegetation, it's really hard to see what damage was done. But this is an example of Chesterfield sewer line. And it's hard to see, but if you look at the toe of the, the embankment, you can see the sewer line right at the surface of the water elevation. So that whole bank eroded, exposing that whole segment of sewer line, uh, which could fail at any time. So we need to go in and stabilize that bank. Um, this is also another source for water to get into the sewer line, and have, then we'd have to treat it at the wastewater treatment plant. And then uh, log jams are also a typical issue that we're dealing with. Uh, we have a lot, multiple sewer lines crossing the streams in Lynchburg, and any logs that build up on the sewer lines threaten to damage the sewer line. So we, we need to go out and get out and remove all those, all that debris. Just as a order of magnitude cost, um, it varies greatly from uh, project to project, but if to stabilize a stream bank, a similar stabilization along Blackwater Creek was about half a million dollars. So it can be pretty costly to go in and, and actually stabilize the stream banks and repair the sewer lines. Another impact that we had was we have a um, sewer line project going on. It's called Randolph Savoy Sewer Project. And this project was significantly damaged during that storm event. And we actually, I just received an email while I was sitting in here today, um, a contractor estimate for his claims related to this project, and it's about $68,000 for the damages associated with the storm events. Mm -hmm. um, but it, a number of things happened there. Uh, it dislodged a sewer alignment that was going through a uh, culvert pipe. It blew a manhole <coughs> top frame and cover off, and then there's a lot of debris in the work site. Um, so the repairs have been completed, and we're just now getting the bill from the contractor on that. I think that's really all I have. A couple other items to note that are not in the presentation, but 
Fort Avenue did see significant flooding during that event as well. We had a couple sinkholes that we had to go out and repair over top of the storm lines along Fort Avenue. Um, and then we have a number of other stormwater detention basins throughout the, throughout the city that we had to, we were in the process of going in and cleaning out debris and complete, cleaning out sediment and muck from those detention basins throughout the city. So that, that's an impact to our crews. With that, I'll turn it over to Gaynell, unless there are any questions for me. Any questions? Just one uh, Councilman Huckinson. One thing you had mentioned in one of your first slides that this storm was a 500 to 1,000 year. Normally, we do, the city planners do planning based on 100 year flood zones and whatnot. So, 500 to 1,000, I've never seen that before. So, would, would some of our decisions that we're going to be making probably later with regarding to some things to counterbalance we'll keep that in mind because obviously it's a rarity um, we, we certainly do what we can one of the one of the items that we we're looking at is the uh, the flooding on Fort Avenue and what we could do to to accommodate that typically like a uh, storm system is designed for a 10-year storm event so this is obviously much greater than that and you don't typically design a storm system to handle a storm this big because it just wouldn't be affordable um, but we do have to take into consideration that we are having these storms and they're more frequent and that uh, are causing damage. So we're, we try to make sure that we are taking that into consideration as we move forward. Council missions. How this um, compare to the, the storm where we, you know, decided we had to spend a bunch of money to build a bridge and take down the dam. So that, that storm actually did overtop the dam. It, and when, you, when we say a storm is a 500 to 1,000 year storm event, that could impact the dam differently um, because it depends on the duration. And you can classify a six, year, six hour storm event as a 500 to 1,000 year storm event or a 24 hour storm as a 500 to 1,000 year storm event. And a, five, and a 24 hour storm probably wouldn't impact the dam as significantly as this one did. Um, but the one that overtopped before, um, I don't recall, I think that was around a, a, a 500 year storm event as well. Um, but it, it did cause the overtopping and the erosion of the dam and almost failure of that dam. Um, so it was a more serious storm event than this event was <clears throat> yeah i was just i was just curious how the how it stacked up right as far because i was out there that night yep. sitting on a fire engine right next to the dam yep. um so i think that that storm event actually the rainfall the intensity was greater for a shorter time period so when uh, a drop of water falls in the farthest point of the watershed for College Lake. It takes about two and a half to three hours to travel through the watershed to get to the lake. So if a storm is within a two and a half hour to three hour duration, that's going to have a bigger impact than a storm that's a, a five or six hour storm event. Got it. So. And do you think that um, the, the new CSO project we're going to be undertaking with the, with the tunnel boring and, and all that, is that going to totally increase our capacity to be able to handle these things it will have it will, will from a sewage and sewer overflow standpoint okay. uh, because another thing that happened during both of those storm events is we blew a, a lot of manhole lids across the city so we had raw sewage flowing out on the ground yeah um, in addition to the the storm water so um, the tunnel will help with that significantly prevent the cso events from occurring when we have the big right storms right okay cool Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about public works response. Um, d during these storms, over the couple of days, we had about 30 down trees, which is something that is 
we can handle very easily for the most part. We had numerous road closures and he mentioned some of them. We ran around putting barricades out, trying to stop people from driving through the flooded areas, which can be very, very dangerous. Um, and we did have numerous road closures and the long-term ones that I'm sure you're aware of are Horsford Road, which is now cleaned up and also 12th Street, which we will talk about later. Um, some of our parks had some major damage. Uh, Peaksu was one of them that had major damage. We had to completely uh, surface the playground in the low-lying area and you can see the, the water was all the way up to the end of the slide. We, so we completely resurfaced that. We had to remove mud from all the paved areas and parking lots and we tried to do that before the Commonwealth Games that was coming at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to accommodate that uh, program as well and not have to cancel any activities. Another park that received major damage uh, was Sandusky Park. And again, kind of the same thing. We had to remove mud and debris from all the paved trails and parking lots. Uh, and again, I think Tim mentioned this, this is ha occurring more often than when I first started 35 years ago. It seemed to be once every couple of years and now we're several years and now it, it seems to be happening at least once a year. Um, and then we had other park cleanup items and erosion throughout the parks. We had to do some erosion, for instance, in the Riverside to prepare for the 10 miler. So we had some smaller cleanup uh, stuff throughout the, throughout the parks, down trees and various things. Trail cleanup was a big one. The, uh, the point of honor trail at the tunnel was uh, completely blocked with three to four feet of mud and debris. And that took uh, several 25, 30 dump trucks to haul that mud away and get that cleaned up. We had to clean up all the many of the trails near the, near the creeks. Um, again, get mud and debris off the trails. And we are still working on trail repair where the tra trail eroded um, at, next to the stream bank. And we are making those repairs and we continue to make those repairs. We had about three to four culverts that, and there are street culverts that were blocked throughout the city with this debris. And we hired a contractor to clean that out. We do not have the equipment that, available to be able to clean that out. Um, we also had major debris at Holland's Mill Dam and on Holland's Mill and underneath the bridge that we had to clean up. Again, we got a contractor to do that. And we have done uh, ditch repair. Uh, this picture happens to be on Concord Turnpike that flooded down near the wastewater treatment plant and somebody actually had to abandon their car down there. So we did a, a bunch of ditch work around the city, but that's a picture of, of uh, Concord Turnpike. Another major cleanup was on Horseford Road. Again, that was about 25 dump trucks worth of um, debris. Uh, we were also did, we removed some additional trees off that bank and pulled some of the uh, loose material rock and various loose material off that bank to make it safe and it is reopened. And that happened to be a car of somebody who tried to drive up over the mud <laughs> and thought that that was a good idea. The impact to public works, it's not really truthfully right now a, a big budget item, certainly not asking for any money. Most of this recovery work occurred during regular time and so we were not able to perform our regular maintenance activities, mowing, playground maintenance, weeding, those type of things. And so we get behind and then we start to get complaints. It also affected brush and bulk because we had to pull those trucks to help do this, some of this debris cleanup. Um, also, our engineers got pulled off their projects, particularly to work on the Horseford Road uh, erosion as well as the, obviously 12th Street erosion. So the impact is really to our maintenance activities and being able to keep up and keep our properties in good shape. And again, our, our operations, just like Mr. Mitchell mentioned, we are continuing to perform repairs. We, are, we were actually down on Point of Otter Trail today trying to continue repairs. And obviously we'll be talking about in a minute or two about the 12th Street stabilization repair. So we'll continue to work on these projects as we have time. And um, I think that's the end of my presentation on our storm activities. Thank you. Council Missions. I just want to, uh, to thank you guys and Public Works specifically. I don't think people really understand the 
Um, one, the danger associated with, with what you guys do in these storms and getting out there and closing roads and trying to keep our citizens safe um, and working with the public safety departments, how important that element of, of what we do is to public safety uh, and the essential services of government. So I just want to thank you for that. Thank you uh, for taking care of our citizens during that storm and uh, appreciate the hard, the hard work. Thank you. Dr. Wilder. Yes, I want to thank you as well for all the hard work during that time period. I mean, because it was, um, I was out driving part of the police and the trees were down. I was calling the 911 and they got several calls about that. So I appreciate all the work again your staff does in these, time, in these challenging time periods. Now, I see the, the amount of the, the cost of that. Is there any type of assistance we can get for those funds or just funds from the city that we have in reserves? We're paying for this out of our general fund budget. Uh, we've got the ability, a couple of small storms a year we can pay for out of the general fund budget. Um, sometimes when uh, it becomes a VDAM or a, or a big, much bigger project, and obviously we are gonna talk about the 12th Street stabilization that requires more money, typically we can handle a couple of small storms a year, so there is no really need um, to, to supplement the budget at this point. Donna, our CFO, has always been very gracious that if something were to come up and later that we see we need money because we get a couple more storms that I can talk to her and we can discuss what might be best. So. Uh, Mr. Bennett. Uh, Dr. Wilder, to your point there as well, um, what we're also seeing is, um, you know, we, we talk about the, the average or frequency of these storms and there's a litmus that the state has as to time, duration, some other factors that go into it that um, we throughout code or have an account that the different departments walk back to with Donna to make sure that if it is determined by the state that there are supportive um, funds and or resources to help with what damages have happened, um, what, what we're running into is that they're just, just costly enough but not as impactful as enough to, to get that state support. So it is this kind of interesting um, balance between the two, but uh, thank you for your question. Last piece. I just said I wanted to commend you anyway because of, as you drive around the city, you just see so many beautiful landmarks, like with the Fifth Street, Fifth Federal, Fifth Street roundabout, and and these, the, the the work in front of the stadium, all over our city has such beautiful landscape. So it makes our city more attractive when persons come and visitors come and citizens come to see how pretty our city is. So I just want to commend your staff for always making sure everything is well groomed and and attractive in our city. Thank you for that. Um, one that you know, I was glad that you all discovered and found. I drove by it right after it happened. It was a big tree down off of Carroll Avenue in a creek. And so I thought, well, it's not in the way, so nobody's going to see it. It's kind of not blocking a road. It just happened to fall right along the creek. And I thought, well, I'll wait a little bit before I call, and I'm sure not many people see it or whatever. And just last week, you, you know, the crew was out there cutting it because it's in the creek, which is going to impact, you know, storm water and, and, and all that. But you, you found it and got rid of it. So that was fantastic. Thank you. Agreed. And I want to also mention that I was at Peaksview Park this past weekend for the, um, or week before last, with the Special Olympic Softball Tournament. And I was just amazed at how, um, how beautiful the park looks, considering it was just a short time ago that we have those pictures. So again, uh, to, to Rex Park, and I mean, to Park Rec, and then also to the Public Works Department for all your great work. Please let them know that we're really appreciative. Oh, yes, Councilman Taylor. I'd like to thank Public Works for the unseen things y'all do. That there was a neighborhood where there was trees and vines all over the electric boxes and the citizens was complaining about no lights and all. Public Works went in, cleaned the neighborhood up, and they said thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, moving on to the 12th Street stabilization options. Is that, are you going to stay up here for that as well? I'm staying up here. Okay. Lee Newland may help me with some of the engineering details, so okay. I'm call on him. But yes, I am going to do that particular item. Great. Um, tonight, we bring or today we bring you three possible uh, stabilization items. Uh, this came or options. I'm sorry. This came as a result of the work of a consulting engineer, as well as our public works engineering staff has been working on this feverishly. 
And so we'd like to talk to you about those three options tonight. The idea would be if that hopefully that you will give us some direction on which option that you would like to pursue at the end of the presentation. So that's kind of the ask that we're looking for. Okay. Um, so let me get into it. Um, and I will go into these in detail with some more detail behind it. Uh, option one to stabilize, uh, stabilize the bank is a pinned mesh option. Um, the option two is pinned mesh with a shot creek finish. And what shot creek is, is basically concrete that is shot up on the bank. So it's like this pinned mesh is like almost like, like a fencing might be the best way for me to describe it. Uh, heavy duty fencing if you're, if you're a layperson like myself. And then shot creek is a concrete shot up over top of that mesh. So that's another option. And option three is a pinned mesh with shot creek but with a much nicer finish on it. Um, so that's where the three options are today. And let me get caught up to myself. Let me talk to you a little bit about some of the background on this. There was a previous failure in June of 2001 of that bank. At that time, the previous physical development committee directed us to remediate and stabilize that bank. And so we did do that at the direction of uh, the physical development committee. During that time, we found out that that bank, most of it, or almost all of it, except for a very small portion at the bottom of the bank, is private property and is owned by the people on Federal and Jackson. So the people at the top of the bank own all the property on that bank. So at that time, we did get easements for construction as well as maintenance of that bank at that time to be able to um, provide a repair. Um, understand that of all, but three of these options, all three of them will require us to do some slope preparation. So that's going to include removing the existing mesh that is there, removing all of that, removing any additional trees that are on it, and also removing all the lot, uh, loose rock and soil that's up there. So we're going to have to scale the bank back some to try to, again, get all that loose material off. Also, all these options are going to require that we basically add a piece of guardrail at the top of Federal Street that is damaged and it's kind of hanging off of Federal Street at the top of the bank. Probably some, a little <coughs> bit of improvements to the stormwater system and we have to replace the safety fence at the top of the bank. If, if the private property's at the top, if you ran, if you were a child or an animal and just ran, you would go tumbling down the bank into 12th Street. So all the options will require slope preparation as well as some of those additional items that I mentioned. So option one, pin mesh. So this is basically installing a high strength mesh over top of the entire bank. It's about 16,000 square foot of bank. And then anchoring that mesh at places in various places throughout that slope to hold that rock and soil in and hold it back. Um, some of the pros and cons of this um, particular option are obviously it's going to help protect some of the private properties. Some of the private properties are very close to the edge of that bank at the top. So it will protect some of their land, obviously protects the traveling public from any chance to get hit by debris. Um, and it will hold that soil and rock in place. So it, it definitely will work and it is a uh, acceptable engineering solution. Some of the cons are that that solution requires maintenance and that we are going to have to do maintenance probably three to four times a year. Um, and that is going to mean closing 12th Street three to four times a year. Mm -hmm. What is entailed in closing 12th Street is basically there's about 7,400 cars that travel that per day. And the current closing, if you've ever driven it, is we have two detours. One is to go up 11th Street, which is a very narrow street through a historic neighborhood, which is not ideal, to take 7,400 cars, even if you split it half and half. That's a lot of cars to go through a neighborhood. Um, and then the other detour uh, actually goes through what is what we call Dunbar Drive, but has been vacated. And so that's school property now because they wanted to vacate that property to make it safer for the children to cross the road. The children cross the road there to go to athletic events across Dunbar Drive. So that is now 
private or school property and typically we would not want through traffic through there so you know I rode through there the other day and if you're if you're not paying attention there are a lot of children crossing that road during the day to do athletic activities so those are some of the cons of, of that particular option uh, the maintenance that's required is going to be spraying herbicide woody brush herbicide for three to four times a year and we all and it's going to leave some dead brush on the bank so that may not be super attractive and then we will have to possibly get our contract forestry crew in there to cut some of the brush off the bank probably at least once a year if not twice so that's option one pinned mesh and then we've got option two pin mesh with concrete finish and this is going to be a rough finished pro uh, project think of the mesh being up there and then like i said taking concrete and shooting it up all over top of the mesh so it's just going to be a concrete basically on the bank it'll be concrete color we're not going to color it. it's just going to look like concrete it will not have any kind of finish on it it's just going to be shot up there the pros of this is that there's no maintenance required once we do it we can we can just let it never have to do any maintenance no spraying no mowing, no cutting, and no closing the road. It will be a permanent, long-lasting solution. Again, obviously uh, safe for the traveling public and will help preserve some of the properties at the top. Um, the cons are it is a rough concrete finish. It's not going to have any pretty finish on it. It's just going to be concrete color with blown up onto the bank. Option three um, is pin mesh with Shot Creek but they can stain and sculpt the finish to make it look more like, like natural rock or something similar to natural rock. Again, it's gonna weather over time, so it will look more natural as time goes on. Um, the pros are the same as option true, no maintenance, uh, no need to close the road, um, and obviously a more, maybe a little bit more attractive finish and long lasting permanent solution. So those are the three options that the engineers um, came up with. Uh, the cost summary is on the, the cost summary is here. Um, pinned mesh is about $2.1 million. Option two with the concrete face is 2.5 million. And option three with the pin mesh and the sculpted and stained finish is 3.2 million. Um, the idea would be we, we'd like to kind of get some direction from you guys about which option you would like. And what we're going to do is staff will come back as soon as possible once we know what, which option we're doing with a funding plan. And it's probably going to be a combination of funding. It's going to be a combination of some highway maintenance that we've received that we have not appropriated yet. Uh, maybe some reserve for contingency and some general fund balance um, monies that may be available. So it'll about, probably be a combination of those uh, type funding sources. And with that, I will conclude my presentation and let you ask questions and discuss. Thank you so much, Mr. Benda. It's okay. Um, you have one more. Uh, oh. oh. Go back. There you go. Sorry. Um, we're not going to put it all on you. Um, we're going to give it a recommendation. So Sorry. No, sorry. Go right back. Yeah. Uh, our staff does recommend doing the option two or three um, because we think it's just, number one, we don't have to close the road. We won't have to do any future maintenance. Um, it is, uh, it is going to be ongoing maintenance. No need to coordinate with the private property owners. No road closures. And so that's why we do recommend that more permanent solution. However, all three options are engineering appropriate. So any of them will work from an engineering perspective. And with that, I will let you discuss. Okay, thank you so much. Vice Mayor Fraldi. Would you mind going back to the uh, cost breakdown slide? I appreciate it. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my question would be related to if option one, right, has a continued cost associated to it over time, even though it's a 340 something thousand dollar difference over time, it will be more expensive. Um, so. It, it certainly is not something that we've currently planned for. We would be doing it three to four times per year. Um, 
it would require us probably closing the road for most of the day yeah. um, and you're gonna have a crew of uh, probably four or five people out there um, for the full day so theoretically though it is safe to say in theory again that option two would in the long run be cheaper or more cost effective yeah, I, I certainly it would save us some maintenance money and maintenance time for sure. If you're talking over the 20 years or whatever uh, the life of this thing is, it potentially could, you know, end up shaking out as being pretty much co cost effective to do the option two. Thank you. Council missions. So I got a question for you. It's kind of along the lines with what uh, the vice mayor said, but you said that there's an old steel mesh that we're pulling out of there yes so how when was that installed in 2001 that was the recommendation at that time so to me it's almost kind of a no-brainer to, to skip the option two if we're 22 years later i guess now we're ripping out that steel mesh because it just it didn't what, what caused that to fail did it just get overrun by erosion and sediment and is that what happened I, we, our engineers thinks it's a couple of different things. That guardrail at the top of Federal Street. Oh, you want to answer that? Sure. Okay. Yeah. And I got one more question for you before, after after he's done. But yeah, that's what I'm curious about is why, why did that fail? Because I don't want to spend money on something that's going to fail again in 20 years. Yeah, it, it was put in in 2001. It was a draped system is what they call it instead of a pinned system. So it was anchored at the top and anchored at the bottom. And it was designed to... Uh, when stuff failed, you'd go in, open it up, and take the failed material out and close it back up. This was a whole lot more maintenance-intensive system. Um, we got our year's use out of it, um, but it just wasn't maintained. It, being Having to close the road to maintain it, it wasn't maintained probably as properly as it would have or it should have been. But the engineer said that um, those systems will probably last about 12 years, and we got about 20 years out of it. Yeah. Okay, so going back to you, uh, Ms. Ms. Hart. Um, so for me personally, I'm, in, I'm inclined to, to agree with the Vice Mayor on that, that it's kind of a no-brainer to go with, with option two on that. That's the way that I feel. Um, one question that I do have, though, when I look at this, you know, we're, going, we're, we're increasing, it's 12 bucks a square foot to go from option one to option two, and then another 52 to go from two to three. And I know that the majority of that is the labor in the sculpting. The one question that I have is, what is there an option to stain it? Because you can dye concrete before you spray it. And is that something that would be more aesthetically pleasing at a nominal cost? I guess is a question that I have. Is that, is that something that's... It's, yes, it's possible. Is Do it, you have a price on it or a I, I don't have that in front of me, no. But yes, it is a little bit more to stain it. It's still the rough uh, concrete finish that's being I, I, sprayed up on I it. would just be curious to see how, you know, if that's a very nominal cost, I'd be curious to see what it would be to stain it um, without sculpting it, if that would make it more aesthetically pleasing. I'm not inclined to spend the extra to sculpt it, but depending on what the other is, you know, I could be maybe talked into it. Dr. Wilder. Yes, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. This has been a consistent question I'm getting about 12th Street. Um, looking at, and we know we just kept taking option one off the table pretty much, but actually options two and three, what is the time period for those two options? Um, if, if we can, we've got to bring the funding plan back, so that will be October, that we will hopefully be able to bring a funding plan back. We're going to have to give time for the, for the contractor to immobilize. Uh, the principal engineer estimated it might be next summer before we open, so you're talking May, somewhere around there. And it kind of depends on winter. If we have a very mild winter, they'll be able to work all winter long on that bank. But if we do get weather, that is going to delay it. So I don't want to promise something and then we get weather and we're not able to get it done on time. So I'm very cautious, so I'm going to stick with probably uh, May, June of next year, assuming we can get uh, the funding sorted out fairly quickly and award it to our contractor. And the same time period for options two and three, pretty much the same time period? 
for both options? Uh, I would say yes. I mean, obviously sculpting is going to require a lot more labor, so I would think against then. Then I would definitely go with summer as the as the time frame for the sculpting. So, um, I, yeah, I, we just we just need to get our funding lined gotcha. up. Right. And do we, um, as far as the funding piece, do we have a possibility for that? I think you heard some state funds are. Would, would it, we have any options? This we can continue to look, but uh, like what I was explaining before, the event itself didn't merit um, a state kind of uh, <coughs> declaration, and so as such, we, we've accounted for what the expenses were, um, but for that that one event, we there isn't, as I understand it, any kind of resources from the state to help support. The last part question. Um, is it possible that one side could be opened, or is it just best to keep it all closed for safety reasons? At this time, we think it's, we, our staff recommends keeping it closed for safety reasons. Uh, again, it might be fine. There might not be another heavy rain, but we are concerned if we get more heavy rain or days of rain, maybe sometime we have gotten three, four days of heavy rain in a row, we think there could be another failure, so we would recommend keeping it close. Okay. All right. Thank you. Vice Mayor Brolding. I think, uh, I think Councilman Missions brought up a good point about uh, aesthetics, and yet it dawned on me just down the road we're starting to build out more public art space so maybe there might be some wisdom in not putting an aesthetic pleasing at the outset just to give the opportunity for continuing that trend of what downtown lynchburg is doing just for consideration um that being right across from school i could only think of the possibilities of what public art could be used there so just for consideration Catherine Huggison. The, the uh, I remember when this first happened a long time ago. So it seems like you said that it got the life expectancy. Lee, um, now the life expectancy of option two is another 20 years or a lot longer, or who, who, hard to tell. It should be a lot longer. The, the difference with option, well, with the previous system was trying to keep stuff out of it, and you had to constantly maintain it to keep it from growing. And then, like I said, it was a draped system, so it was supposed to allow stuff to slough off and you'd have to clean it out. With the pin system, it's got anchors going down into the rock holding the mesh on it so you won't have you won't have the, the sloughing off that you have. And it, and it sounds very easy, I'm not very easy, but a logical conclusion to go with option two um, from the maintenance and closures and just figuring out all, all the items. Um, th that area, I don't know how aesthetically pleasing it needs to be because you know when you drive up and down 12th street i mean you can't i mean you're going down the hill and that's that big hill on the on the left as you're going down really hard to see i'm sure it'd be kind of neat but the, the only problem with option three if you were to do that i know that the uh the sculptor would you could see like almost like a mount rushmore of lynchburg heads <laughs> you <know. laughs> can't you see that so let's not even be tempted with this mount rushmore of heads uh, option two sounds sounds good and so you think back to uh, sterling's question about the the time of when you could do it you think that was not going to be till next year well, I mean, we'd like to start as soon yeah. as possible, but we got to get our funding lined up before we can cut a purchase order and enter into contract. So, so it, with that, with the funding, since it is a 20-year, I think you said, lead life expectancy, at least, at least. At least. So typically, 20-year life expectancy is a CIP type item. It's a bond finance. Whether we do the bands or uh, some of those things, I think we should be able to go fairly quickly with that, even though we don't have a, a whole amount of you know the 2.4 million bucks to pay for it right away but we're in that i think that uh process because it is a cip type item it's not shouldn't be just simply operating on um, because it's 20 plus years so that should free up i think your flexibility for financing it so well, we can bring back uh pvc meets again on uh, october 10th um, and uh, make sure that we have funding options there for the that committee and then um, depending on what comes out of the committee, we can talk about that on that, that that same evening. So, would it be appropriate for uh, to make a motion for option two, or do we all? Wait, I would say that it sounds like a consensus. Is there a consensus on option two. I think it's 
I think we have a consensus, and I think it'd be good to bring back maybe just, I, I like the idea of just at least seeing what the cost would be to the tinted concrete, just to see. I mean, I think it's not a horrible idea just to see where we are with that cost to see if it's not way off. But I also love the idea that the vice mayor brought up about the art space, too, because I think that'd be really cool and fun for our, uh, our citizens. Seventh grade kids repelling that. off the slope. <laughs> well, there'd be a safety rush. component yeah, there, so we we'll have to idea. decide which artist. Maybe you better close the road uh, while they're which, repelling which off the artist, side of the mountain. Yeah, maybe which artist participate, <laughs> but I think you have to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It sounds like a direction for, for option two is, is what we're looking at, so. I think the yeah. would turn it. Uh, so the yeah. yeah. All right. Thank All right, you very thank much. You. Appreciate it. Okay. Now we're moving on to our business item briefings. Appeal of the Historic Preservation Commission HPC decision to deny a certificate of appropriateness, a COA, to the, at 713 Pearl Street. This item will appear before council for action on October 10th, 2023. Ms. Eve Mergenthaler. Thank you. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of council, Stephen Malacy of Upkeep Homes, LLC, is appealing the decision of the Historic Preservation Commission to deny an after-the-fact certificate of appropriateness to replace wood windows with smaller vinyl windows wrapped in aluminum, replace the front door, replace elements of the front porch, and replace the rear deck at 713 Pearl Street. The commission reviewed the petition on June 26th and found that the replacement work is not consistent with the Lynchburg Historic District's residential design review guidelines. The house is located within the local Diamond Hill Historic District. The work was completed after a stop work order was posted on the property and without approval from the commission. The appeal will be brought before you as a public hearing item at the October 10th meeting and Chair Shanda Horner will be present to represent the commission's decision. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from council? Council missions. So just to make sure I'm clear on what I'm saying here when I look at the door. So the door on the left is what was original and the door on the right is what they've done. Yes. And that's in violation. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then the window. It's a we're seeing like a three step thing here where they had the old wood windows. They put in the smaller vinyl windows mm -hmm. and then they wrapped the gap with some type of aluminum mm -hmm. to those windows? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, how it was explained to me uh, in another conversation was, and I, this is just for clarification, because I, I like to give grace where we can. You know, um, the question I had in this case, I think Mr. White and I talked about this, was, was the owner aware of the um, restrictions? Were they, explain to him or her um, kind of the process of that. What I was told, I think, by Mr. White was that the owner was explained of the, uh, with the restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, the stop order was placed on the property. They proceeded with the work anyway. So there were multiple efforts on our behalf, as far as the city is concerned, to have a conversation with the owner about the violations taking place. And they were, seems to be ignored. Would that be a fair word to use? Yes. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. So there was knowledge, and it was ignored. There was an explanation of what the expectations were. They were ignored. Just yes. I want to make sure we're clear, clear on. It wasn't someone that uh, kind of did the stuff and then is asking forgiveness after the fact because they really didn't know this was explained to this person. Yes, there okay. were several conversations, both over the phone and through email, and the applicant had received a COA previously. Okay. So. Okay. Any other? Oh, Councilman Huggles? I guess just the being uncomfortable with when somebody fixes up a house that was kind of derelict um, or even if it wasn't fixes it and improves it I think that's a good thing Dr. Wilder yes this, this house is in my neighborhood um, it's around the corner so I see it like every every single day um, I know that my neighbors are coming to the public hearing because they they are in support of the, the decision from the the historic committee because um, they felt like the the owner did not listen to the recommendations from the historic committee so i know the neighbors are coming at that particular meeting and some of them have several of them have reached out to me in reference to that as well um and the house really I'm, i know the owner who i'm the few passing up i know he went to a nursing home i know the owner it wasn't really a bad looking house but they have dressed it up but it wasn't like a derelict property um yes thank you mm. Yeah, you want uh, 
kind of want to point out that um, I feel like what was done there was creative and I would like to see options, I guess, from the city moving forward to maybe lessen up some of those restrictions to get approval to allow these sort of things because, you know, when I look at, there are derelict properties throughout the city that these things would apply to um, where they would look a hundred times better if somebody took the creativity to do that in a much more cost-effective, efficient manner than putting back, I mean, like, how can you not say the front door on the right looks better on the left? It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so I just think that we need to figure out how to balance um, the liberty of our property owners to be able to repair their properties and uh, renovate them and, and still have them be aesthetically pleasing. Did you have something? Okay, yeah. Councilman Tiller. The roof has, has been replaced on the house. Uh, no, not, not on this Years house. ago, it had a tin roof on it. Uh, that was probably before now, this now, owner. I, now I would now you have shingles on it. Uh, uh, you have asbestos siding on it. Mm -hmm. that, is that historical? Right. I'm just asking the question. I guess the question would be, you know, when those when those modifications were made to the house, or if they lined up at the time with the uh, historical society's requirements, when those changes were made, is probably what is being asked. I'm guessing, but and I and I agree with uh, Councilman Missions. I think and the house looks beautiful, and we've had these discussions before. A lot of these changes look really nice. Um, it's just we're, we're right now we're discussing process and procedure of what you know permissions and, and the regulations that are put in place right now. But I think if there's um, a, a desire to have a discussion with our uh, historical society uh, members to talk about changing um, some of the restrictions, I don't think that's a bad a bad discussion to have. But I guess in this case, we're just talking about again the process in which this was done. So, any further questions? No. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, moving on. Conditional use permit towns at Misty Mountain Townhomes 532 and 536 Leesville Road. This item will appear before Council for Action on October 10, 2023. Miss Rachel Fresheisen. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of Council. Um, the subject property at 532 and 536 Leesville Road contains approximately five and 875,000 acres. The purpose of the petition is to allow the construction of 44 townhomes and associated parking as part of the overall development and additional eight duplexes fronting Liesel Road and Mist Misty Mountain Road uh, would also be constructed. The duplex units are permitted in the R3 district and do not require council approval. The property being zoned R3 allows townhomes upon approval of a CUP from council. The city's future land use map recommends a medium density residential use for the subject properties. These areas are characterized by smaller lot, single family detached housing, duplexes, and townhouses at densities of uh, up to 12 units per acre. Where neighborhoods already exist, infill of development should uh, reflect and be at a compatible density and housing type. The proposed townhomes align with these recommendations for density and development type. Planning Commission held a public hearing on September 13th and recommended approval. The item will come back to City Council for a public hearing on October 10th. Thank you. Councilman Hogson? Thank you. Uh, the, the, a lot of these developments that have happened in Ward 3, I, I have been appreciated. I met with the developers and the plans that they put together, they listened to my concerns and they did a great job. And I told them that I'm in favor of this. The, what they're doing is connecting in the back. They're having these townhomes uh, nice. They're not changing the zoning from an R3 to an R4 but they're requesting keeping the zoning the same and asking for a conditional use permit. And I think this is very good. I think the developers have done a great job uh, in, in dealing with the neighbors. I think it'll connect nicely to some other townhome projects that are going out in that same area. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing this approved. Council Missions? I, I firstly, look on that side of town. Um, very much appreciate the, the connection with Misty Mountain and Leesville Road there. Um, I think that that is going to be incredible because it's going to pull some of that demand off of Timberlake as being the only way coming out of those apartment complexes right now and, and other. I just, I like what they've done. I like the plan. Um, 
I think the renderings they provided are beautiful, and I think that's going to be a great fit on that side of town. My sorry, Foley? I just want to mention there was uh, one, I can't say constituent, it, it was from Ward 3, um, but it was a, uh, someone who did express a concern, and they live in the 542 block of Leesville Road, um, and they were concerned about the development. I just wanted to log that for, uh, for our consideration. <coughs> But I do echo the sentiments of, that have been expressed thus far. Who's the developer on this? Uh, it's Sundance Design and Build. Okay. Uh, Bryce Harker was the representative at the Planning Commission. Really? They're really beautiful uh, drawings. Okay, great. Anybody else? No? Thank you so much. Oh, you're staying up here. <laughs> Just stay where you are. Okay, conditional use permit, University of Lynchburg office space 333, 335, and 337 College Street. This item will appear before council for action on October 10th, 2023. Thank you again, Madam Mayor. Um, the purpose of this petition is to allow the conversion of three structures at 333, 335, and 337 College Street from student housing to office space for professors at the University of Lynchburg. The properties are zoned R2, low medium density residential district. College and university uses are permitted in this district upon approval of a CUP from city council. Each parcel contains a structure that was constructed in the late 1930s and has been used for student housing since uh, approximately 1989. The properties are surrounded by other parcels owned by the University of Lynchburg and are adjoined by an existing parking area behind the buildings. Planning Commission held a public hearing on September 13th and recommended approval. The item is scheduled for a City Council public hearing on October 10th. Great, thank you. Any questions? No? Okay, moving on. Conditional use permit, University of Lynchburg laundry facility, 504 Westwood Avenue. This item will appear for Council, before Council for Action on October 10th, 2023. Thank you. Uh, very similar to the previous petition, the purpose of this one is to allow the conversion of an existing structure to a laundry facility for use by University of Lynchburg students. This will allow the university to consolidate washer and dryer units into a central facility rather than having them dispersed uh, throughout several student housing buildings, which would ease the burden of maintenance on those machines. The property has been used for student housing since 2001. It contains a one-story wood frame vinyl siding structure built in 1910. The property is surrounded by other parcels owned by University of Lynchburg and used for student housing. Planning Commission held a public hearing on this item on September 13th and recommended approval. Again, this will be scheduled for City Council public hearing on October 10th. Okay. Any questions, anyone? No? Okay. Moving on. Conditional use permit and is it flume or flum? How do you say it? Flume. I say flume. flume amendment. <laughs> Neighborhood commercial to medium density residential Wards Ferry Road apartments. 3146 and 3150 Wards Ferry Road. This item will appear before Council for Action on October 10, 2023. Ms. Rachel Fresh Eyes. Thank you again, Mayor. The purpose of this petition is to allow the construction of 19 apartments in a B1 limited business district. The property is recommended for neighborhood commercial uses on the city's future land use map. Neighborhood commercial areas are, pretend, are primarily intended for uses such as office, retail, personal services, etc., that are scaled to be compatible with and serve their immediate neighborhoods. The petition proposes to amend the future land use map to medium density residential. These areas are intended for housing such as single households, duplexes, and townhomes densities of up to 12 units per acre. The petition originally pro proposed 24 apartment units. The petitioner chose to revise the number of units uh, after the planning commission meeting. The property consists of one and six tenths acres at a density of 12 units per acre. The petition would support 19 units under the proposed future land use category. However, the apartments do not align with the recommendation for development type in the medium density residential district, which is single household, duplex, or townhomes. Additionally, the Wards Ferry Road corridor study, which was adopted by council in 2014, noted that Wards Ferry Road has a significant amount of traffic and increasing densities along the corridor could cause issues and may necessitate the widening of Wards Ferry Road and the widening would require right-of-way acquisition, including a number of homes. The Planning Commission held a public hearing on August 23rd and recommended denial of the original 24-unit proposal. The item is scheduled for City Council public hearing on October 10th. Okay. Um, I drive through there every day and 
what I what I want to see is something done right there because it's kind of some derelict properties there. Um, I just don't know if what's being proposed is the right solution. Um, can you speak to why the why the recommendation was for denial? Uh, it mainly was based on the Wards Ferry Road corridor just study the corridor and study. just the capacity of that road and knowing that future uh, that that increasing density would add units and trips because uh, if, if I remember correctly and somebody in here probably knows that would, would that also include that where that um, kind of house and trailer is as far as amending the future land use map that is on the opposite side of Copley Place uh, or is that, it just that house in front of it that trailer is not part of it it's just the I guess the south side or of Copley Place yeah because because I think that trailer and some of that other stuff there that was set up when they built the New Heritage High School as the construction office and then it was just kind of left and abandoned it there um, but I, I, I don't like I said I don't I don't know if this is the right plan um, but I would like to see you know if even if we end up needing to give the developer more time to come up with something to do there because i think it's definitely we need to do something with that piece of land right there has there been any pushback from any of the neighbors or anything on this uh there was one neighbor in particular at the planning commission meeting who lives on the name of that street to the south is escaping me but that residential Adam right Drive. There. yes councilman Hudson. When I first saw this, I thought, well, man, may, hopefully this could work, but it's really difficult. The Planning Commission <clears throat> voted, looks like, 7-0 against it. It is tough to put more density there, especially when it's a business zone. Um, the, when I'm reading this, you, you mentioned several different numbers. Um, Rachel, you first said they denied 24. Yeah. I'm reading this, it says the recommendation they even denied 19 units in our report. Um, th they denied the 24 unit proposal um, is that on the agenda summary that's on the recommendation it says recommendation it'll appear on City Council uh, public comp hearing denial uh, for 19 unit apartment complex I heard a 24 uh, uh, 21 but I'm reading 19 technically they recommended denial of the 24 units um, the petitioner heard that concern about the higher density than the future land use map category they were asking for because they were exceeding 12 units per acre um, and they chose to revise it after the planning commission meeting um, which we we have allowed in the past um, if they are scaling something back or uh, adding a proffer between planning commission and city council um, historically we haven't forced them to go back to planning commission if city council felt like it would change the petition significantly and wanted to send it back to planning commission you you have that option um, so th this right here what i'm what so i'm reading it just we got the, the facts straight the, um, on here now they're proposing 19. correct the planning commission voted for denial and staff still recommends denial even a 19 because of the wards road uh, wards ferry road connection and because that does seem a little problematic how that because it comes out fairly close to Timberlake right there like you know so yes uh, so even though they did reduce the number of units it's still increasing the density which yeah. the Wards Road corridor plan re recommended and, and right against. behind there as I read the report and Planning Commission the the property owner's been there a long time owns a lot of you know about the same amount of acreage <laughs> so it is a you. it's a challenging entrance with yeah. Copley Place as well anyone else Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on, review of the City of Lynchburg's 2024 legislative agenda. This item will appear before Council for Action on October 10th, 2023. Ms. Matthew Braun. I am so pumped. This is my first time to present to you guys. This is, uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, and members of City Council. Um, uh, I am super excited to present our 2024 legislative agenda. Like the mayor said, this will be in front of you on October 10th for a vote and available to you as a resource on November 14th during your legislative dinner. 
I want to thank the city council for working with me to compile your priorities and the departments for bringing forward the needs of the city. You'll notice that there are three primary buckets, education, public safety, and economic strength. It became clear to me in my conversations with each of you that these are really priorities for all of you. In the area of education, we would ask the state to expand, uh, expand and provide funding for early childhood education and pre-K initiatives, enhance the standards of quality and K-12 infrastructure. Additionally, we would ask for support for legislation to make it easier for localities to transition from an appointed <coughs> school board to an elected one. Without exception, this council supports public safety. The agenda would expand the Line of Duty Act to cover all public safety personnel. It will continue to address blighted properties and derelict housing. <laughs> it would support legislation that will get our police officers out of the hospitals and back onto the streets. It would protect our law enforcement officers' personal information, modernize state public safety grant programs, reinstate primary offense enforcement, and expand protection for children from secondhand smoke to include vape and marijuana. Next, economic strength. This agenda would provide localities ability to assess business license tax, modernize the communication sales and use tax, continue and expand economic development grants and programs, and protect the city from unfunded mandates. Finally, a couple of additional items. We would ask for support for legislation that would pay our state-supported local employees a competitive wage and for a change in FOIA exemptions. This change would make it easier for elected officials to access otherwise exempted public records. That, ladies and gentlemen, is your 2024 legislative package. I am happy to answer any questions and take notes during your discussion. Anyone? All right. Cue my exit music. I think you're good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Please do. Oh. <laughs> good job. No, that's out of order. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Moving on to roll call. Uh, we will start with Dr. Wilder. I was trying to make a comment in reference to the agenda. I was, oh, that's I'm okay. Sorry. But um, that's okay. This, so when we bring this back, are we just, so some things I might not agree with, are we just make comments at that moment or? Um, I do both. Yeah, okay. So we'll make comments at that time period when it comes back. Um, it just, um, I just didn't agree with everything. Um, had some concerns about certain areas, but I would address those concerns before we vote on the agenda. Okay. Um, um, it's okay, no problem. I was just, I was, I was finishing up my reading pieces of it. Um, I didn't really have anything. I just, I just want, I do want to commend our governor for. I think he gave a grant to the downtown association. I believe it was about how much? Do you remember how much it was? The aggregate, I think, it was almost close to. Three hundred. I just want to commend the governor because I believe it's just in, in, in the importance of our downtown association and working with to continue to revitalize the downtown and give a support to businesses and relocating downtown and support for them that part of the day early part of the year. I just, I just want to commend our governor for believing in that and, and investing in our downtown merchants and making sure our down to continue the process we have been doing over the past 20 years and revitalizing downtown. It just goes in line with that. So I want to commend our governor for the investment he's making in our downtown businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Dolan. Um, I want to embarrass our clerk of council oh, yes. by congratulating her for the terrific article in the News in Advance this morning. It's certainly well deserved and you are a great example of young leadership in our city. Thank you. That's wonderful. Okay. Uh, Councilman Helgeson, I know that you had uh, requested a specific item regarding a public hearing on the city's tax policy. So go ahead. Um, I guess, first of all, what I do want to do is commend our school board. You know, we do have state law that all school boards have been under with regarding setting the comprehensive plan, uh, article or state code 22-1, it deals with every school board is supposed to sign off on the comprehensive plan and the comprehensive plan shall include a forecast of enrollment changes, a plan for projecting and main managing enrollment changes include including consideration of the consolidation of schools to provide for a more comprehensive and effective delivery of instructional services to students and economies in school operations. This has been state law for a long time, and school boards historically have kind of just said, ah, yeah, we should do that, but we haven't. I think our uh, Walter Irwin, our city attorney, said, yeah, they're supposed to be doing that, and they hadn't. It's been years ago. 
um, when the new superintendent came, I pointed this out that with the declining enrollment, you got to do something. And I'm very thankful that the school board took action. Do we like their action? Yeah. I mean, it's, is it perfect? No. Is, is anything perfect? Absolutely not. But they're taking action because of the fact that this is what their, one of their, their, their duties of a school board member is, is to actually do this. And it benefits, not only does it benefit, uh, and it actually correlates very nicely with what we've done up here behind this dais this last budget year. What did we do? We gave more money to instruction. We gave less money to administration. If a, you know, a couple schools close, that means the school children will probably go from one classroom to another or one building to another. Um, and have less administrative costs, so we can focus more in the classroom. I think this is a, a, a great action that they took. It was bold, you know, but it shouldn't be bold because they should have done it for 20 years. Where you guys came from in Norfolk, pulled up how many schools were closed in Norfolk over the last 10 years? A lot of them. How many were closed in Roanoke? How many were closed in Bedford County? Bedford County, which is 800 square miles, you close body camp, and that means you're riding on the bus for an extra 45 minutes. We have schools. I've been to all the, a lot of the different schools, and I, and I say, how many are close? One of the schools I was at this afternoon, which is why I got late to one of the meetings, um, I click on the GPS. There's an elementary school, six-tenths of a mile, seven-tenths of a mile, 1.2 miles, 1.3 miles. So. Making, act, making a decision and making action for the betterment of our taxpayers and for the betterment of our school children. What would we rather see? Another principal, assistant principal, staff, or would we rather see another violin teacher? And that's where it's important. So I'm glad they took action. I know it's tough, but that's what they're, they're supposed to do by their charge. I'm very thankful. Um, so I want to applaud them for taking action. I know anytime somebody take, it's, it takes action, there's people upset, people happy. So yeah. they took action and I applaud their leadership uh, for, for taking action. Secondly, apparently this is on here, this item. I, I sent several different items that I think we should talk about at some point and this on here, as, as you mentioned, a public hearing on city's tax policy. So lots of times we, we have public hearing when we're thinking about just raising taxes, right? Or, or whatever it is for a budget. So with the budget, it's really correlated and, and going with spending. So people say, hey, spend the money, we want it here, or we think our taxes are already too high. I think it would be nice to have a public hearing uh, separate from the normal budget process where we can actually hear from citizens. We did some great things this last budget year. Some, some tax policy that has been long needed to be changed, like lowering the real estate taxes, like actually lowering the business license tax so businesses can thrive, like doing, getting rid of uh, the, the, the license for small businesses. Um, we've done some really good things, and we've done it because we kind of thinking what's a good thing and what's not. But I think having some level of public hearing at some point, doesn't have to be any time soon, um, or this week or whatever, but to be able to hear from others. You know, if you, if you look at and listen to good supply side economists, they'll tell you that all taxes are bad. Some are worse than the others. We need taxes for roads and schools and police and fire and all that. So let's figure out which ones are the worst that we can help lower or help eliminate, so our businesses and our citizens and our property owners can thrive. Um, I, I think it's, it's always a good uh, to hear from citizens. Having some level of public hearing um, that is separate from the spending of it, I think may not be a bad idea. Um, I just throw that out there. If, if anybody else thinks that would be nice, maybe we can schedule that at some point. Um, because obviously we don't, we're representatives. And so we like to hear from people. You know, there's certain fees that you would never know about um, had you not heard from somebody. And so maybe not a bad idea to hear uh, from what other businesses or property owners or taxpayers uh, think that we could do to, to help the city thrive even better than what we were doing this last budget year. 
So thank you. Thank you. Council Missions. Councilman Taylor. Yes. Uh, my roll call item is to City Manager Boehner, Bender. I have a question. The question is about DEI and how of the employee, how does it affect the employees of the city? As far as the policy we looked at two weeks ago, we looked at the city policy. You had merit, you had opportunity, and equality. Now, how does DEI fit into this? Um, Mr. Taylor, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to answer, but I need Dr. Holly Jennings here, and we're, she's just upstairs, so if, if it's okay, Madam Mayor, Maybe finish roll call and yeah, she'll be sure. here in just a second. She'll help me answer if that's okay with you, Mr. Taylor. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll move on and then we'll come back. Okay. If she's coming downstairs. Yes. Vice Mayor Feraldi. Just want to encourage folks, uh, early voting is now open for November's general election. It is open at 825 Kemper Street, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 p.m. Do your research on the candidates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So I have a few remarks tonight. The International Economic Develop Development Council, or the IEDC, the largest nonprofit professional association for professional economic developers in the world, selected the Economic Development Authority of the City of Lynchburg and the City of Lynchburg for the uh, Silver Award for its real estate redevelopment and reuse of the Virginian Hotel Redevelopment Project. This award honors organizations across the country for innovative real estate development or reuse projects for the creation of jobs or for increasing the tax base. As noted in the award application, the redevelopment of the Virginian Hotel was a $29 million investment that produced an economic impact of $59 million. Now, in its fifth year of operation, the Virginian Hotel boasts 115 guest rooms and suites, three restaurants, and a historic ballroom that hosts weddings, conferences, Conferences and events up to 144 sorry 440 guests and supports over 80 full-time jobs for our residents congratulations to the city of Lynchburg and the Economic Development Authority on the award and successful redevelopment project and congratulations to the Virginian Hotel on celebrating their five-year anniversary that's great news I also want to take a moment to recognize the 49th running of the Moore and Giles Virginia 10 miler this Saturday, September 30th, and the Amazing Mile Children's Run happening near Amazement Square the Friday before. Each year, the Virginia 10 miler brings in nearly 3,000 runners and hundreds of spectators throughout the Langhorne Road and Rivermont Avenue neighborhoods. Please visit lynchburgva.gov to learn information on street closures for both of these events, and good luck to the runners. I will not be running but I will be cheering them on. Okay, now we will be highlighting our fire department tonight. For the past 140 years, the Lynchburg Fire Department has been an integral part of the services the city delivers to its citizens. Its rich tradition of being first in safety, first in service, and first in community has made it a respected and innovative leader among the Commonwealth's fire agencies. Comprised of more than 180 uniformed personnel across eight fire stations and another 11 civilian staff members, the department responds to more than 19,000 calls for fire and emergency medical services every year. Its highly trained members also provide specialized services by way of hazmat, technical rescue, wildland fire, and drone teams. The LFD is an internationally accredited agency, one of just 315 
such departments across, across North America. This recognition means it meets or exceeds an industry-wide set of standards for equipment, performance and training, among many other categories. LFD personnel are also dedicated to serving their community outside of their normal work duties through public education classes, school visits, and neighborhood walkthroughs. The department is a proud partner in a number of worthwhile charitable causes, such as One Community, One Voice, Relay for Life, the MDA Fill the Boot campaign, and many others throughout each year. Moving forward, the Lynchburg Fire Department looks forward to opening a ninth fire station in the near future while it continues to replace and upgrade its firefighting and emergency medical equipment. Everything from new air packs to ambulances to fire engines to ultrasound services, all designed to provide the best, most efficient services possible to the citizens of Lynchburg. Yay, LFD. And on another note, because we're talking about public safety, I would like to acknowledge um, a headline that I read today about our police department. It said uh, Lynchburg police sees international package containing drugs. Uh, the Lynchburg police seized an international package Tuesday containing eight pounds of ketamine, according to the department. Police say that the LPD vice unit received a tip about a package arriving in Lynchburg that contained drugs. And uh, they worked along with our U.S. Department of Homeland Security to make that bust. And that is wonderful because that just saved a whole bunch of our citizens. So good job, Lynchburg Police Department. We are grateful for your hard work. Okay, and we're still waiting for... So, Madam Mayor. Yes. May, uh, Mr. Taylor, back to your question. Um, Dr. Jennings was called away and she may appear suddenly through that door in the next uh, few seconds, but I, I will kind of appeal to Deputy City Manager Greg Patrick. He was the one that talked a little bit just recently with you about um, the certain hu um, human resources policies and also to include uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, Greg, to the degree that you can um, address Mr. Taylor and some of his questions about, um, I, what was it, Mr. Taylor, how DAI is implemented or how it's talked about? How, how is it? taught to our personnel gotcha. and, and how should they respond to it? Um, Mr. Taylor, thanks uh, uh, for the question. I, I, I think when you're talking about uh, a DEI, uh, the, the first and most important thing to understand is it's, it's not about race, it's not about um, any of the protected classes we discussed uh, last uh, two weeks ago necessarily. It, it's really about making sure that we create a, a, an even playing field in the city for all of our employees, right? Uh, so that we do things to make sure that uh, um, everyone has equal opportunity, equal access uh, to opportunity throughout, uh, throughout the city. Uh, we teach this in a number of different ways. Formally, there's, uh, there has been some trainings uh, uh, for uh, department leaders um, that, uh, that uh, we've, we've done over the course of the last year. Internally, we're, doing, uh, we're, we're putting together uh, DEI plans within each department. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, at our, at our last um, leadership meeting or department head meeting last week, we had all of our departments kind of share uh, what the, their DEI plans were for, for their departments. And I think what's really interesting is um, no one is mentioning things like, you know, we, we want to hire a more, more diverse uh, group of candidates. We want, uh, you know, to see more, you know, women working in the department. What it's really about is creating a culture in each of the departments and in the organization overall um, where everyone feels uh, welcome, feels like they have the opportunity to succeed, feels like um, uh, they, they, the organization, their colleagues um, respect, acknowledge them. Um, and uh, I, I think, uh, you know, my overwhelming takeaway was uh, we are, you know, through these DEI plans, we're doing the right things to create a culture uh, where everyone can be successful within the city. Um, that, that should be right there with your... Uh merit, opportunity, and equality. So why do we need extra? Uh, extra, if, if uh, are you refer, what are you referring to as extra? The, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, 
Why do we need DEI? It, it's, uh, it, it allows us to um, intentionally focus on creating this culture within, within, the, within the city, within the organizations. It, it allows us um, to uh, um, make sure that we are paying attention um, we, uh, here's Dr. Jennings, who's going to speak much more eloquently here. Uh, um, make sure that we are being intentional about making sure that everyone across the, the city and the organization has, has equal opportunity to uh, all, all of the opportunities um, within, the, within the city. And uh, we'll turn it over to Dr. Jennings. Well done, well done, Greg. Well done, <laughs> well done. Was not prepared for that, Mr. Taylor. <laughs> I was listening on my phone on the way here. You were doing a good job. Oh, thank you, thank you. Did good. Where do we leave off? What other questions do we have? Why do we need DEI? In the city as an organization? Yes. Okay, so there's a couple things I would say about that. First of all, um, DEI, in its true sense, is kind of what Greg Patrick was going to is to make sure our organization is being intentional about who we're hiring, how we promote, how we retain, and that it's fair. Um, we want to make sure that our practices citywide are fair and that we are promoting and giving opportunities based on merit. And so the best way to do that is have a person who is responsible for making sure those processes are fair. That would be my number one answer. My number two answer is making sure that we're taking care of our workforce. Um, 40 Six percent of our workforce is female. Around the same number are people who are not white. And so when we look at um, merit opportunity, excellence, resolutions, the question that I get asked most frequently was, what does that mean for me as an employee? And does that mean that I still have the right to come and tell you if something not good is happening to me here in the city? So it's also an assurance, having a DEI program is an assurance that if something is not happening that's not fair, regardless, race, gender, what, whatever, within the city, that there is someone there that takes those concerns seriously and has the opportunity to respond to them. Um, it also, sorry, I'm out of breath. I ran up the steps. <laughs> I need to start working out more, apparently. Um, the other part of that is that we are also a very young city in the sense that the average age right now in, in Lynchburg is under 30. Most young folks that are looking for an employer are looking for employers that are committed to having an inclusive environment where employees are treated fair and they feel like they belong. A DEI program is intentional about making sure that you have that. Um, we, there are the top 10 employers in Lynchburg, we fall in that category because we employ about 1,400 folks. All of the top 10 employers in Lynchburg have a DEI program. And so therefore, if we don't have one, that makes us less competitive as an employer in the city. And our employees are vital to making sure that we can continue to deliver services. So that's kind of my long short answer. I could probably continue to add on that, but that is the purposes of why you want a DEI program in, in your organization. Um, a couple things, one I kind of want to point out that we've navigated away from roll call because the rules of procedure say that roll call shall be designated time where council members may individually and publicly speak to matters relevant to the city, its citizens, and or operations of the municipal corporation for the second work session in a row. Um, and I'm glad that I actually got the floor this time um, for the second work session in a row. We've created a situation where staff is able to respond to one council member, but at least I'm not being silenced this time. Um, and we've completely blown from what our intention is for roll call in here. So question um, regarding this whole conversation. You said being intentional about who we're hiring. Mm -hmm. um, what is the intention? To hire people that are best qualified for the position. Okay. And that comes with diversity, equity, and inclusion to that, that to be most qualified, you have to consider diversity, equity, and inclusion. I I'm think trying to understand how 
those two pieces marry together because mm -hmm. if you're being intentional about who you're hiring based on diversity, equity, and inclusion, then that sounds to me like you're being intentional about who you're hiring based on factors, not merit. Right. So um, what falls under diversity, equity, and inclusion a lot of times is compliance. And so equal employment opportunity tends to fall under diversity, equity, and inclusion practices. And if you are being intentional about hiring the best people for the job, you want to make sure no one's being excluded. Um, and the best way Nobody's to do being, that, you want to that? make sure the best people for the job are not being excluded for okay. any of those factors that you're talking about. It's not saying I'm going to include people just based on other things other than merit, but it's making sure people are not being excluded on any other factors other than merit. We shouldn't be doing that anyways because that's discrimination. That's correct. And to have someone that's purposefully and intentional monitoring to make sure that's not happening is a good practice for any organization. So I've got another question for you. Um, and then this kind of goes back into the culture of the workforce. You know, mm -hmm. when you've got one public safety employee who um, actually assaults somebody in the workplace, gets a protective order against him, right? And then is still paid on administrative leave with pay for well beyond a year and no action is taken. And then you have another public safety employee who is charged of something cleared of that, but then he's recommended for termination, but they have different skin colors. How's that fit? So I would not even try to attempt to address any current human resources personnel matters. Um, that's not for me to do. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you generally, we should be consistent across the city in how we are um, administering discipline. Yeah, and, and that's, that's my concern is that that's not happening. And that's verifiable. And um, that's a good reason to have a DEI program and, so and, that we can make sure that that's not happening. Well, what we call that in the, what, I mean, before I retired from the Ghost Guard was, was the civil rights office. We had a civil rights officer, mm -hmm. right? And it yep. was strictly looking at compliance. Um, and I feel like that some of these programs may morph into something else beyond what, what the intention is. We, we need to comply with the law. There's no doubt about that. Um, and you and I had yep. a great discussion about this. Um, but on the, on the other side of that, we also shouldn't be publicly funding anything. Like you mentioned when you read that MEO resolution, you said in that meeting that those concepts were the concepts that they were the tenets of critical race theory, correct? That's correct. Right? Yes. So, so what's wrong with eliminating the possibility for government to fund those concepts? In that same meeting, uh, respectfully, we also had disagreements about what is critical race theory and what meets those standards. And I think that's the hard part when you put something like that in place. It becomes very vague as to one person thinks if you talk about anything diversity, equity, and inclusion related, even if it's just a training about harassment or discrimination that we're required to do annually because of the federal funding that we get, some people will say you can't do that because that falls under critical race theory, falls under those tenets. But in fact, it doesn't. But we've kind of reached um, just in our society in general, a point in which when we talk about those things, people want to say, hey, we're talking about critical race theory, which in fact we're not. Um, and the tenets listed in there are components of critical race theory. And critical race theory has its place. A lot of times it's in law school, it's in philosophy classes in college. It's not in a workplace training program. And that's not what we're doing here. Um, but, but when you put something that, to that in place, there's all these differing ranges of opinions on, hey, are you actually implementing critical race theory because you're doing an anti-harassment or discrimination training? Um, and so that would be my major concern about that. And yes, I did say those are the tenets of critical race theory, and we're not intending to incorporate those in any workplace training. Um, that's more of a philosophical um, discussion in a college class. Uh, but the problem is, there's a range of people who will respond and say, yes, you are, are teaching critical race theory because you have a harassment training. I wouldn't that. necessarily agree with that. I mean, as, as far as, there may be people that say that, um, but the way you characterize the resolution, I don't agree with. Mainly 
based on the fact that it was very specific in defining these are the divisive concepts, these concepts shall not be funded, that we will prohibit the city from using taxpayer dollars to fund and further these concepts. Um, and like it or not, there's an effort across the country right now through organizations to use government to advance these agendas, right? Am I, is it happening here? I don't know. I, I can't tell you because there's, what is it, 1,300 employees? About that. Right? So who knows what's happening inside of all the workspaces? But what I can say is there's no reason that we can't prohibit what's happening in other local governments from happening here. Um, when you look at some of the localities that embraced a lot of these things early on, um, you look at the disasters they've turned into, like Portland, Oregon, right? I don't know about the rest of the people here, but I know I love Lynchburg, not a fan of Portland, and I don't want our city to be anything like that, right? So in order to prevent that from happening, we can prohibit the funding for certain things and then make sure that there's accountability for that. And that's the entire intention of this resolution. Um, so I just have, um, I appreciate you and I appreciate the conversation we had and, and I, I don't think you're trying to pull anything over on anybody. I just want to be clear about that. Um, but I am concerned about other efforts going on with inside the city government and other practices going on inside the city government that I feel like it is absolutely necessary to take a firm stance and say that we are going to prohibit funding these concepts. Councilman Taylor, since this was your roll call item, would you like to um, address this? Yes, thank you. you. You've been very helpful. Yes, sir. You're thank welcome. You. Yep. Okay, moving on to closed session. Consideration of a closed session to review and or evaluate the performance of the city manager pursuant to section 2.2-3711A1 of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended. May I have a motion to go into closed meeting? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, please go ahead and vote. All right. 